everyone, and welcome to another special Black History Month edition of This is Revolution Podcast. I am your host, Jason Miles, and if you are new to the show, please hit the like and subscribe button, and don't forget to hit the bell as we are constantly adding new programming to the channel. So we want you to be ready and alert anytime we go live with something brand new. That being said, we have been busy in the This Is Revolution universe. Um, I was a guest yesterday on the David Feldman Show. It's up on YouTube. I've been sharing it out on the Twitter, so please check that out. Uh, tomorrow night, I will be on Bad Takes with Joe Payne and, of course, creator of the Anglo Pessimism shirt, J. Andrew World, where we will be talking about one of my favorite movies, Better Off Dead with John Cusack. Also, my co-host and I, in our uh, partnership with The Real News, have a new interview up with Giannis Varoufakis, where we talk techno-feudalism, but more importantly, we have a small debate on what's better, Star Trek or Star Wars. So without any further ado, let's bring in my homie, my dog, my co-host extraordinaire. He is the... Pascal Robert. Peace and greetings to the chat. Peace and greetings to the audience. Peace and greetings, Jason Miles. And all of you who have not gone to check out our Giannis Varoufakis interview on the Real News Network, do so too sweet immediately. It's a great interview. I checked it out again. Everyone who had told me they watched it, they liked it very much. So that yeah, will only sure. probably be outdone by this interview. And he really was throwing up uh, Vulcan gang signs. Like, <laughs> that's not, that's not a joke. He, was, he was about that Star Trek life. He made that shit very, he really was. very serious to me that Star Wars is for punks and he was living that Trekkie life. And uh, so watch it just for that. And then he's apparently he's going to come on our show. And we're going to have a debate on what is better. And I'm all for it. Giannis, bring it. I know you're the finance minister and you know everything about this ain't about economics, goddammit. it. It's about quality cinema. Okay. That being said, does anyone know the album behind me? Pascal, do you know the album behind me? Nah, man. That looks like no. some evil Knievel shit back there. It's close. Close. Um, before we bring in our guests, we made a clip. By we, I mean me. So get ready for tonight. Editor Horace Wells. Well, any newspaper uh, is inclined to follow the uh, the thinking of the majority of the people in the community and this community and and I myself have uh, favored segregation all down through the years uh, back when this lawsuit was filed in 1950 uh, we did everything we could to maintain segregation uh, by trying to provide the Negro students with good equal but separate facilities and that was the way the community felt and that's the way the community wanted it as a systemic social order, the purpose of segregation was to impose through law and social regulation a doctrine of white supremacy that established boundaries on the politically thinkable in much the same way that the anti-communism would nationally during the post-World War II decades. It is worthy of note as well that the victorious ruling class didn't impose the regime in most places until blacks and many poor working class whites had been taken out of the political equation by disenfranchising them. As Adolph Reed Jr. writes in the introduction to The South, he is constantly struck by how much the ways that things had changed in the South seemed to underscore the ways they hadn't. This idea of continuity being inextricably linked to change is one of the most important points to take away from this reading in large part because it highlights the fact that Jim Crow was in some respects a malignant symptom 
of an even greater cancer that we have barely begun to address how the architecture of the social system directs the content of people's lives and the individual and collective sense of who they are and what they deserve. We'll discuss Adolf Reed's latest book, The South, and more. This is Revolution. Oh, and the South, with a new sense of dignity and destiny. Negro Americans, my friends, are on the march for their rights. Thank you for watching. Please don't forget to hit. Well, all right. Well, all right. Let's before we bring in our guests, we have a surprise guest. It's a surprise. Didn't know we were going to get a twofer. We, we have coming all the way live from somewhere in the bowels of Illinois. The Toure Reed. What? What? The family affair, right? Here we are. How did this happen? Uh, the magic of texting and <laughs> screaming. <laughs> what? We were talking about this right beforehand. So we were, I, I, but you thought you had, you told me you had other obligations. I do, but I'm here briefly. I just wanted to show my yeah, yeah double read it. They say double read. You get double read it. There it is. Oh, y'all, y'all are making my Black History Month special. Y'all are making this. It's not even. It's not even black. It's cream colored because we got two light skinned niggas here. <laughs> Yes, yes, and uh, well, one usually when we have light skinned people on, it's to uh, it's to prove that we're not racist. <laughs> that's what it is. That's All right, thank is. you for your service. Yeah, that's yeah. And then when you leave, I just want you to know I make all the light skinned jokes I possibly <laughs> can because I do believe you people are the ones that created the rumor that Negroes are always late. I say no, 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 no. Us darkies are on time. It's the light motherfuckers that's late. Well, I do my part they... to be late as often as possible. That's it's my thing. It's my signature. See, so I'm ruining it for everyone. Jason has his own kind of internal machinations with the light skinned folks. I try to, I try to give him some therapy to combat. I grew up in the '80s and the '90s when light skinned dudes like that looked like or Howard Hewitt with chest hair that looked like a shag carpet was taking all the women. So. That's the, by the time you came around, that started to change, man. You were in the Michael Jordan. He's movie. on the West Coast. He's on the West Coast. That's true. That's true. It's, it's, it's different. They was like breeding them. All the mixed dudes, the barge. It was like that in the 70s when I was coming up. But Michael Jordan and Wesley Snipes put a, put the kibosh in that. For my oh, Wesley college. Snipes, Jungle Fever scene one definitely put a kibosh on that. All the light skinned dudes was messed up. Sorry, Tere. Oh, I, I had right? a great time in the nineties. So speak. For you, right? <laughs> that whole thing was overblown, in my opinion. <laughs> well, uh, changing subjects. Often, when we think of the past, we view it through the lens of a flattened understanding of the times. Segregation, as our guest explains in his latest book, and I would say a bit of a memoir. The South was enforced on whites as well as blacks. That reality is obscured in a contemporary perspective that flattens out history and uh, and context into a simple polarity of racism, anti-racism, and reduces politics to an unchanging contest of black and white. That perspective compress is well, excuse me compresses historical distinctions between slavery and Jim Crow and ignore the generate of struggle, off often enough biracial or interracial against ruling class power over defining the, oops, sorry. <laughs> it might, my screen just went out on my words. Damn it. Sorry about that. I fucked up. My screen just went out. All right, Captain. <laughs> so without any further ado, I will make up for that loss. The Adolf Reed. Thank you for joining us today, and thank you for dealing with my technical difficulties. Oh, it's my pleasure. Like I said before, like I'm just like I'm sitting here with a virtual shot of vodka, so we're gonna have a good time. <laughs> no, we're gonna have a good but time. I, but, but I was looking at that photo that you guys found, man. Well, that was from an Ayatsi strike action in like Hyde Park in 1996 or seven. It's wild. 
I, there's a lot of there's a lot of photos of you, uh, you and your son, because you guys are professors and you write books. Of course, you have to have uh, headshots, mm -hmm. and I I hate headshots. I hate taking headshots as a as right. a person that's been in the music industry. I can't. I don't know how to stand for them, so I yeah. try to find uh, action shots. Mm -hmm. Either one of you are like musicians. It's hard to find action shots, but. Uh, I was surprised to find that when I almost asked Teray if he had any throwback photos he could send me from the mustache years. I think Jason likes to go into the Wayback Machine and find the oldest <laughs> picture of you. He can forget all the other rationalization. If you can right. find a picture of you in '72 trying to have an afro in off, and I know that wouldn't be happening, he would have took it and put it. You might have had an well, afro. What about that uh, driver's license picture? Yeah, yeah I'm going to send it. Uh, 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 it's an ID picture, but yeah. Okay, that's what uh, it was. Yeah, I'll send it to you right now. Um, it's like Ron O'Neill as a hijacker. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> right. Like Ron O'Neill when he was in Red Dawn talking Spanish, and he was like, that's, that's <laughs> Ron O'Neill is super fly, but commandeering an airplane en route to Cuba. But listen, <laughs> I know there's going to be a lot of comedy that's going to pop off while I got you here, but I just want to say, both if Torre is a very good friend of mine. We talk frequently. Uh, Jason, I see all the time, so I don't have to acknowledge him right now. But um, no, Torre is a good friend of mine. We talk all the time. Adolf, we've been emailing back and forth for probably over a decade. And, oh, yeah, uh, I think that's right. Yeah. And um, But, you know, me becoming close to Torre, I feel like vicariously I get all the 411 on your life through him. <laughs> because, you know, as most people know and detest about me, I'm very much influenced, more so from Bruce Dixon, who exposed me to you, who oh, both okay. of you are actually more simpatico in your views of black politics than I think both of you had ever realized. And sadly, one of the tragedies for me personally, Bruce told me this, that you guys had never had the opportunity to meet. No, that's all, right. Yeah. One on one. Yeah. But, uh, Bruce was a very, very strong admirer of your work. And oh, he I actually was a very was strong work. admirer of Bruce's work too, man. If Bruce yeah. actually introduced me to you. And I remember the first email I sent you was an article I wrote in the Black Commentator called The Revenge of the Good Blacks. And you said, oh, yeah, we're basically fellow travelers. I said, first thing I said after reading some of your work, I said, I wish I had been aware of you in the 90s. I would have been able to understand why these Negroes are so jacked up back then instead of having <laughs> to struggle through all this on my own all this time. <laughs> but um, it's Black History Month. I got both reads who I consider friends almost family, and I'm very happy. I just wanted to say that so we can get down to this book. Right. Well, cool. Well, 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 thank you, brother. I appreciate it. And I just sent you the uh, um, um, uh, the photo in question. Oh, shit, he did. We, we're going to share a screen, but I'm going to wait. What year was this? Something very uh, you had like 73 or two? 74. 74, okay. Yeah. So... Well, Professor Reed Sr., what prompted you to write this book? I know it has a, a bit of a mm. memoir feel to it, which I really, really dig. But what was the impetus? What were you What were you doing? Was it just the contract was up and you had to do something? <laughs> no, no. Um, I'll tell you what it was. Like this, no, I mean, two of my good, good friends, uh, one six years older, the other 10 years younger, both with like roots in the deep south and i started talking really around the turn of the century just kind of musing what the kind of shit you do over a drink about how when our you know rough cohort left the stage of history um there'd be no one around anymore with any direct and organic lived connection to the jim crow era so we you know we talk about that every now not now and then uh, and then around 2002 or 2003, I just started writing uh, with no particular objective. Uh, and I kind of quickly wrote myself. I've said this on a couple podcasts lately. But I kind of quickly wrote myself into that 15,000 word no person's land, right? That's too long for an article and too short for a book. And at that point, it was like... Um, you know, some general overview stuff and, and a handful of vignettes. Um, and, uh, and it just kind of languished in, in that state for a number of years. I'd make a half-hearted attempt to try to get it published 
somewhere in some form, right? I was thinking more of an article than a book. Uh, and when we were out actually at the Southern Historical Association a number of years ago um, with Barbara Fields, um, I mentioned it to her and she asked to see it. And then she, she basically it insisted that I publish it. And um, she first put me in touch with a friend of hers uh, who was an editor who ironically lived across the street from where I lived in New Haven uh, or around the corner. Um, and she, she supported the idea, but she wanted me to put like more of myself in it. And um, I was kind of resistant to that. Uh, and, um, uh, and then uh, I mentioned it to my former agent, Faith, Faith Childs in, in uh, Manhattan. And she asked to look at it, and she got back to me with like a dozen or 15 specific things to do, and that's what I needed. So I did it, and Verso liked it. But uh, but the interesting thing was Faith tried to sell it uh, to trade presses, um, in, including what used to be called Nation Books. It had just changed its name then. And, and the response that she got from acquisition editors was that they didn't know what to make of it, right? I mean, they didn't know what kind of book it was supposed to be. And the woman who was a nation editor or the former nation editor um, said uh, that when she saw that uh, the proposal was coming into the project by, by me, she got excited, but then she read the prospectus and couldn't figure out what the hell it was supposed to be. So, uh, but fortunately, um, Verso liked it. And that's how it became a book. That's what's up. That's what's up. Well, listen, Adolf, this is um, it's a joy for me, not only because it's Black History Month, but you, you, you put down some markers in this book that are very, very important in, in clarifying. This book is a clarification. That's the way I look at it. That's why mm, I define yeah, it. Oh, good. Yeah. Because, um, Thank you. Um, and I knew where you were going with it, and you can you can tell me. I think you said something in the beginning of the book that I found fascinating. Is that you stated? That's an interesting picture. You said that it was important, or you basically stated that Jim Crow has more to do with the current situation of American politics vis-a-vis -vis Black America than slavery. Now, for me, who has been reading your work and been affiliated with, with Bruce Dixon for years, that's mm -hmm. not a controversial statement. Right. But in the context of the where we are in today's contemporary black thought, we got we got we got we're going to have a long conversation about that phenomenon. Mm -hmm. It would particularly seem strange to some people who, number one, think slavery is the center fulcrum of all black life, and right. number two, many of a, of our contemporaries. Of various ages for various reasons who like to romance jim crow and say everything was good back then if it, and it was integration that messed us up yeah you know like on the latter point like every time i hear that right I mean, my thought is you know i wish i could just take that motherfucker and like drop him for like six weeks in the mississippi delta in 1950 and like to go back and pick him up uh, I feel like you could drop them now in the Mississippi Delta because that person doesn't live in the South and they'd right. be terrified. Oh, yeah, totally, totally. Well, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah but Joe Wood said, said, said to me once, he was talking to Paul Gilroy, and this was in the 90s, who um, was pontificating about America, which, you know, uh, uh, black Brits like to do on the way to picking up those black status jobs. Um, and and Joe asked uh, uh, Gilroy if he'd ever been to the South. And he said to Gilroy, I said, oh, no, I'm, I'm afraid. And, and Joe said, yeah, well, you know, it's kind of hard to, you know, get a handle on this country's history if you don't spend any time, time there at all. But, but yeah, people uh, tend, tend to romanticize it, right, a lot. Well, but, the, the particular reason why it really pisses me off is, number one, most of the folks who do it, or from my generation who never lived during Jim Crow. Right. Uh, right. Number two, they think that the picture they have about one guy who happened to own like a lollipop shop right. is the epitome of black capitalism and black business. Right, right. And, and, and number three, what bothers me is that 
a lot of the Negroes who say this are major thought leaders in the age in which YouTube is giving political education or some education to whole segments of Black America, and they're right. actually academics. Right. Well, and the last part uh, is it is what's really most frustrating and disturbing, isn't it? I mean, because if because there have always been people like in barbershops, right, or mm -hmm. right on the street corner, right. I mean, with uh, Mm -hmm. um, with wisdom, basically, uh, uh, of a homespun sort. But yeah, yeah, but that this has become um, conventional wisdom among people who are supposedly paid to be scholars is, is quite something, right? Well, um, I tell you what, like a friend of ours, uh, when I mentioned that a, a recent encounter with uh, a precocious um, grad student who made a reference to the non-event of emancipation that's mm -hmm. kind of rolled rolled off his tongue like something everybody understands and and I've learned as a result of that from from, from the friend that uh, that this is the line that the afro pessimists like, Saidia Hart Hartman and uh, what was that slave brother's name? Uh, the one from Minnesota. Um, Wilderson. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> slave brother. Oh. I mean, he said it. Yeah, I mean, that's how he did. <laughs> right. Right. So I, mean, I don't know if he had a Mandingo fantasy playing in his head or what, man. So he Pastor, don't I don't even want to speculate. What was that no, no, that uh, Wilderson reference there? Oh, uh, I, I got to be so heavy to say. Right? Tori puts it, it on me. It was in an interview, and somebody asked him, well, uh, yeah, yeah, I don't want to pry, but how do you square this, the whole rest of the world comes together around anti-blackness with the fact that you're married to this white woman? And he said, well, I'm her slave. <laughs> yes, he did. But you know what? You know one thing that we're leaving out of that slave comment and the other comment about if I'm nothing, you're nothing, we're nothing together. With oh, the black. oh, oh, yeah, right. That was another you one. know, we're oh, leaving wow. out the fact yeah. that, you know, when you come from the literary world mm -hmm. and your goal is to sell books, you have to lay it on a little thick. I guess you do. That's why we're talking about him because he lays it on thick. Yeah. Well, let me tell you, we, we, this is. <laughs> I have a specific question that deals with contemporary black thought that I want to get to. Because okay. listen, we could do this all night because this is this is too good and we don't want and we don't want to do that. But address the first question for us, Adolf. Why is Jim Crow the oh. appropriate uh, way to frame the correlation of contemporary black politics today as opposed to slavery? Did you want to prep it, son? Because the Tere looks like he wants to say something. No, so I'm just reading the chat. Yeah. I'm, I'm just don't, checking. Don't out. Go oh, oh. Pascal, Pascal keeps ignoring the fact that we have young Reed. You're supposed to pass it to, to dad. We're supposed to see the back and forth. <laughs> One of the twins. Well, we just did that. Uh, well, so, I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm here to right. enjoy the ride. And I'm, I'm not <laughs> being do it us. This is his dad, man. I mean, he doesn't get a chance to hang out with his dad on screen all the time with two black folk. They doing it with Jacobin people all the time. <laughs> oh, 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 there's the shit. You don't never there's want us shade. to get white people to watch this show, huh? Damn. Yeah, I've been mean, thinking this for, for a while, Pascal, but I'm going to see if I can get you well, one of those Captain Crunch hats like Garvey had. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, like I'm, whenever you yell about that shit, you got to put on your Garvey hat. Yeah, we're right. going to talk, talk about that too, man. You know, I, I want us to get. We might save that for the for the patrons only, but we're going to talk about. We're going to clear a lot of air, man. I want. I want right, to talk cool. really. This well, is, you know, read vindication yeah. night. All right. Well, all right. So let me address this one. Um, one reason is kind of simple. Right, that um, slavery was a long, long time ago, and uh, and I mean Jim Crow. What with the Jim Crow era was the kind of formative racial experience for Black people uh, for the first half to two thirds of the 20th century. Right. I mean, what when you think about it, uh, um, the 
to the, yeah, insofar as a substantial majority of the black population li lived in the South for as long as that happened, or 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 for as long as that was the case, um, legal and formal segregation, right, um, codified racial hierarchy, and I mean, disfranchisement were were part or were components of of the essential experience of of most black people in the country. Um, and the most immediate source of contemporary black black politics, that is post-1965 black black politics, was an outgrowth of the uh, of the struggles in the post-war era on uh, near both sides of the cotton curtain. Um, for um, jockeying for position in uh, in pluralist politics like in cities and 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 the struggle against overcoming or the struggle to overcome um, you know that codified uh, new racial exclusion and and uh, and the hierarchy and its implications um, so and slavery had been over right for a hundred years except in that one little corner of Texas um, when the voter rights act was passed so it uh, and, and and I mean, frankly, like on well, the different versions of the legacy of slavery stuff, and there have been several different ones. Um, they always seem kind of weird to me because they call for us, like uh, you know, to overlook uh, you know, everything that happened between slavery and whatever the moment was was when we started counting, right? Uh, and 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 if slavery, I mean, therefore was well. Yeah, if slavery was more powerful than any other black experience or or experience that black people had, well, um, how could that be, right? Right? And how did it count count more than everything that came after it counted? Uh, so it just seems um, clear on its face um, that what we think of as contemporary or post nineteen sixty five post, post civil rights era. Black black politics uh, had to have emerged mo most immediately out of uh, you know, uh, you know, you know, the era that uh, directly preceded it, not 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 slavery. And I think another problem is, of course, that for many or, or for way too many, if not most people of whatever race, um, how how people think about the black American experience in this country is like um, till 1964, right? There's like a, um, a blur, right? This kind of um, a blob of, of the bad old, old timey times that were first or at one point called slavery and, and at another point called sharecropping or, or Jim Crow or whatever. And part of the problem is precisely that people think that what's defined the Black American political situation is an abstraction called racism, not not the substantive institutions that 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 you know, structured their, their presence, frankly, um, and and existence. Well, well, so, you know, so Tori, you know, is that an adequate response? That was good. I want to let Tori come in if he wants to jump in as well. If he wants some clarifying statements. Well, I have a question and it will require my dad to go back to when he was still teaching, which isn't that long ago. Did you find when you were professoring or is the verb professing? I don't, I don't know. Um, Probably when professing, you, I'd say. <laughs> that, that would make more, more sense than professoring. But when you were professing, did you find that often enough with students, their perspective when they walk in the classroom on black life was that there was slavery and then nothing uh you know maybe slavery and reconstruction if they were more sophisticated and then nothing until the tired seamstress decided not to give up yeah. her seat at random and right. as a result so we got that and that's certainly the experience that i've had but as a result did it seem as if what students and their small proxy on to america writ large that their perception of black life came down to kind of often enough came down to blacks having kind of racial memory uh mm -hmm. and now maybe the that framework has unfolded into an epigenetic 
but two versions of the same thing, understanding of slavery. Uh, I mean, just re since I'm still teaching, I get from students regularly, even in my classes in the 20th century, just sort of reflexive um, reflections on slavery as if it's directly pertinent to what we're talking about in the 1940s and not just rhetorically pertinent and, not, and often enough it is rhetorically pertinent, but it ends up displacing what's actually before black subjects or black subjects in their lived experiences in the 40s or 2020s. Um, so would you mind elaborating on that? Yeah, well, I mean, let me tell you one thing. Like, um, I mean, I I always felt kind of uneasy about this, but frankly, you are the first person who, wh whom I've known um, to draw the hard hard line on it, right? It, with, with our respect to undergraduates, but use of the first person plural to, uh, to refer to stuff that happened to black people like in 1840 mm -hmm. or in 1880. Right, and, and it's something that's insidious there. Right, I know why why it happens, and and I was there. Right, when when it got defined hey, as hey, right. Explain what people what that means. A lot of people don't understand. You're saying that when black folks say things like we went through hell when we were getting whipped in the plantation in the cotton field. Right, right, exactly, right. And the only way to respond to that is is what. Well, there are more elaborate ways to do it, but. <laughs> But 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 when Ture was a graduate student, and people would write exams that use constructions like like that, he's just writing the margins. So were you alive in 1840? What do you mean, right? But that construct it, itself it implies something like racial memory, right? Um, Epigenetics, which I hate. Right, and, and it's a small step, right? Like it, it's it's it it it's it's embedded as kind of. It, but I'm not just folk knowledge, but folk knowledge that implies a sense of belonging and respect. But the fact is that it rests on racist premises. Right. Now, has and, that gotten... and, and on premises that are literally racist, right? The quintessence of racism. So in just keeping it, um, I don't know, the high point of your, ac your career as a professor. So we'll mm -hmm. skip the graduate student days and begin... Mm -hmm with your time at Yale and then um, your retirement from Penn, did it get better or worse with time or was it a constant? It was pretty much a constant. Like the bellwether for me <clears throat> was uh, the, what was the undergraduate black politics course, of course, that I taught. And I always taught it uh, with a kind of historical focus, right? So uh, in fact, we were talking about this a few days ago too, Ray, but uh, one, one of the things I did like I started it with, with emancipation. And one of the things that I did was had students, uh, one of Eric Foner's um, big coffee table book on uh, the reconstruction uh, has a compendium of uh, black people who, who, who were elected to office um, in South between 1868 and 1877. And there's more than 400 of them. So I had the students read through that list, read a bunch of other stuff, like the first chapter of Jack Bloom's book, uh, Class, Race, and the Civil Rights Movement, or um, I'm probably screwing the title up, uh, but which is a really good, uh, thick account of the 30 years between emancipation and the end of the century, right? Um, and, 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 and I mean, Judith Stein's great of uh, Mr. Booker T. Washington and others, uh, but you know, you know, essays and other stuff that you know kind of talks about Pascal. I know you mentioned this, the Colored Farmers Alliance, and and other forms of um, political of autonomous political a activity that Black Americans in, engaged in. Right. So I spent a week and a half or two weeks on that, and then, but for for most of the time, or for most of the time I was teaching, most most versions of that course that I taught. Then you get to Washington and them, right? And what struck me what was that almost all of the students would snap back again to a view that, that the freed people weren't really ready for freedom, um, that they, they needed tutelage. And I say to them, so 
What, what did your brain go to sleep on you <laughs> last week? I mean, this is what you just read last week. So how do you put that together with this? But it began to get better toward toward the end. And as I've said, uh, the the best undergraduate course that I've taught that I taught in my entire career was the last one, and it was that black politics course in in in, in my last semester of teaching. And uh, and I mean, Toure joked jokes with me at the time and said, "Well, yeah, uh, well, was that tempt you to change your mind?" And, and I said, "Look, it took me 38 years to get this one right." And you know, I don't have another 38 years to wait for the next one. And plus, I got to feel like Ted Williams, who's the only Red Sox player <laughs> I really liked. I right in home run my last at bat. But I want to address the question directly to me. Someone asked us. Not even Jim Rice, huh? Someone asked us, Pascal, not believe in I, epigenetics. I, I take that I back, Rice. Although, just, what, I'm just for one second. Uh, um, a, a good friend of mine, uh, Jason Cameron, mm-hmm. today. Uh, who, oh. was, who 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 uh, grew up a Red Sox fan fan, fan up in New Hampshire, but in those years, my boy's line was that, that that the Red Sox were the only team that couldn't play Tony Armas and uh, Jim Rice on the same day because it fuck up the racial quota. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but let's have to get that sports thing out of the way, man. Someone asked yes, a question, Pascal. Does Pascal mm-hmm. believe in epigenetics? I know I think epigenetics is horseshit. And I'll tell you right. why I think epigenetics is horseshit. Because if you if you can say that you have the physical memory and scarring and the and the actual biological context of what it was like to be a slave, you know what the ruling class would say? Good, we'll make you a slave again. Ah. Uh. Yeah. Well, well there's look, a related Pascal, question in the chat too that's worth considering. Are you saying that cultural legacies don't leave powerful traces with their own causal logics? So, and, yes. I, and I think it's an expression of this question. Look, I can. Right. I'm going to tell you guys a true story. Okay. On why epigenetics is real. Yeah. Uh, I was working out at the park. Right. The last years ago. That's correct. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, I was working out at the park years ago, and I had one of those resistance bands. And I was like, you know what? I'm, I, and someone was like, if you wrap around a tree mm-hmm. and you do the, the like oh, this. Yeah. Right. Like, right. And I was doing it and I was hitting it and I was like, yes. Yeah. And that shit snapped and it hit me in the back. And I screamed because I felt the pain <laughs> <laughs> of all of my ancestors uh, yes. in yes. that moment. And I'm I ter- to this day terrified of those elastic bands and uh i think they're racist so there you go Listen, whenever, whenever these horseshit theories come around can everyone do any research of the genetic utility of these theories and their yeah. how these stem from genetic early 20th century thought oh, yeah right yeah. right right well here's the thing about the epigenetic stuff though right people who do uh, i mean genetics for a living have understood you know, the gene uh, the gene environment interaction for a long time, right? And that's all at the core of it, um, 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 the, or, or the core scientific claim right, right, to epigenetics is just that, 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 that genes don't, don't, don't determine things, right? I mean, genes aren't like um, homunculi, right? Or, or I mean, homunculus, I forget which, which uh, you know, declension. Um, what the noun is, but and the genes are uh, 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 the developmental pathways of, of of a given gene are first of all um, shaped by the interaction of multiple genes in ways that we don't know, know and understand. But they're also shaped shaped by the environment of the gene, both both within the cell and and an external in environment, uh, what outside the body of, of you know of the creature, right? And I mean that's all it is. But but so, so but what happened was 10, 10 15 years ago, um, biodeterminists like N- Nicholas Wade, who was at that point uh, Times's science writer. Um, did you know started doing a mea culpa about their you know, genetic determinism, and embraced 
a version of what they considered to be uh, uh, to be um, the uh, to be the epigenetic in, in, in improvement, but but what it was really was that they that, that they thought they found a hiding place for themselves in, um, to make the sources that by making the sources of what was then in their minds um, still uh, um, ultimately a, a genetic determinism uh, by uh, clouding uh, the the pathways and and the mechanisms with re reference right, to uh, environmental factors that, that they didn't really pay any attention to anyway, except insofar as they could try to make a claim for something like a racial memory. So, yeah, I mean, you're right. Uh, um, but it's, but from that perspective, w with respect to race theory, um, the way that people try to try to use epigenetics now is just just in the same way that they use neo-lamarckianism like at the turn of the 20th century right um and but that brings home like a key point here that 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 the difference between a culturalist understanding of or, or a culturalist yes uh i think she's full of shit like a christmas turkey um but um, that's joy. I mean, the group is also the traumatic slave way. syndrome. You're, you're busy here, right? Can you explain yeah, Lamarckian, like no. Lamarckian philosophy for our, for our lay people, if you don't want? Yeah, Corey, sure. You want to hit this because you did a very good explanation on my Facebook page for those who are not aware of it. I did. Oh, did. cool. Um, no, I'll uh, defer to to the star of the show on and and well, what no, you want is Lamarckian race theory. Um, yeah, specifically, yeah. right? You don't want yeah, well, Lamarckian it's, theory. Um, so. Uh, the difference between uh, the Lamarckian concept of evolution and the Darwinian one is, and this is kind of overdrawn, but the Darwinian one is that um, that uh, changes that that the organism experiences after birth don't have any you know, impact on or aren't heritable, right? I'm like in any way, and like this is before. And like this was an understanding even before like the rediscovery of the gene, basically, right? Um, the Lamarckian view is that um, uh, is that experiences that the organism has after birth can be transmitted. Um, so, so like the classic uh, example of of, of of like the Lamarckian view is the giraffe whose neck grows longer from trying to reach uh, uh, the higher branches on, or leaves on you know, on the eucalyptus tree. If if his or her neck is elongated uh, you know, by that practice, they, that that's how they transmit like the longer necks to, to to their offspring. And it's important to keep in mind, like at this point, I mean, nobody had a clear theory of heritability the way that we do now. Right. Um, so the way that it played out in terms of race theory it, in, in the late Victorian era was that um, the Darwinian race theorists believed that the differences between races were fixed in biology uh, and, and that there was no way that they could be changed. Right. Uh, and and the Lamarckian race race theorists um, thought that uh, so like their take take was like a vague uh, blend of biology and culture, right? Um, so they tended to be the seemingly more egalitarian ones because the Lamarckian race theorist views kind of open the possibility that the gap between the races could narrow. And as Du Bois pointed out, like, you know, as between the two that were on, on offer, that's the one that made sense for us to adapt, right? But he balked at the, um, you know, at the standard view that it would take at least a thousand years for the lesser race to catch up to them. Yeah, because uh, part of the Lamarckian race analysis is the belief that black people were 2,000 years behind whites culturally, and it would take right. that long for them to catch up. 
And that, right. that's part of the, what was going on with someone like Chap, Samuel Chapman Armstrong that Pascal, right. who Pascal and I were talking about fairly recently. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. Samuel yeah. Chapman Armstrong, who was the mentor, teacher, and godfather, and <laughs> rabbi to Booker T. Washington. Right. We don't have time to get into that kind of thing. <laughs> that's a whole show. I might have to invite you back to a special mom hour for that, but we're not going to go there now. This yeah, I would love it. <laughs> well, Pascal's been on a deep dive with HBCUs lately. We'll and, talk, yeah, we'll talk to Jason about inviting Adolf for a Mau Mau Hour. We have a, I have my own show called the Mau Mau Hour. But we talk, we might have uh, you might do one on Booker T. Washington. Oh, yeah. We're doing the Mau Mau Hour tomorrow too, but it's going to be on a different subject. But I want to get back to the book because there's a lot of gems here that I want to get, and we have we're short on time. Please explain. This is very important. More than I think you realize. And I didn't understand this until I started reading your material, believe it or not. Why does Jim Crow start after Plessy versus Ferguson and not after the 1877 Hayes Tilden compromise? And define oh, okay. both and make that clear, please. Yeah, that's a good question. Well, well, like, like the first answer is um, is that things don't move in an automatic way like that. Um, and um, another dimension of it is that, you know, most politics is local, right? Uh, so black people are participating, uh, they're voting, uh, I mean, they're electing people. And there were elements of even like the bourbon elites who tried to find, find ways to uh, accommodate black voting, right? I mean, not, not necessarily um, egalitarian ways, like, like, um, loading up the truck on the plantation and like giving ballots marked for the Democrat, right, to, you know, to all the field hands, uh, which is well, one of the things that pissed off, uh, you know, whites, uh, well, but upcountry whites, right, was how, how the planters used uh, the majority black population in, in the black belt to control politics, right, through, through, through a different kind of fraud. Um, but yeah, um, and of course there were different um, uh, reactionary, uh, I mean, responses um, to black political autonomy, like in different places, right? Uh, and more um, less concerted than uh, uh, than random, I suppose. Um, I mean, depending on when, when, where you're talking about. But the big push was um, was um, you know, the populist in insurgency, and I mean, um, I mean, as you know, right, right there had been one uh, like the readjuster movement in uh, Virginia had elected a governor and a senator, and and um, and other officials, and it passed uh, you know tax laws favorable to working people, uh, and in fact, at, and another irony is that like the titular head of that movement uh, it was a former Confederate general named uh, Um so the so the ruling class had been you know, anxious, right? I don't want to overstate it, but you know, they had been concerned enough about the possibility of uh, blacks and poor and working class whites forming an electoral coalition or uh, alliance against them. Uh, that um, so, like the populist uh, uprising was like the nightmare come true, and as soon as they put that down, right, right the first first move was to take blacks out of the political equation uh, via a uh, 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 I mean, disfranchisement, and then to install um, a regime of uh, you know, white supremacy that uh, that uh, you know, demanded, in, in the words of former North Carolina governor who had like a classroom building name named after him on my campus of uh, ACOC uh, that they needed a, um, uh, that they needed the strength that 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 come all the white people thinking alike so like that was their version of a uh, of, now, of, uh, of what the black people are doing now now Ado, let me tell you you're moving a little fast because I got a whole question on this subject. <laughs> the first okay. thing I want to tell you is that probably the most important piece of political ed of information I got was not from you, but it was from a mm. book that you put together in an anthology, 
and it was a ple- a book a piece that was written by Judith Stein. Which oh is yeah, no, no, that's right. yeah. probably in all of my life the most important thing I've ever read in terms of scholarship about Black history is that yeah. because what is in that piece and I have here in front of me right now a gem. And as scholars of Black thought and uh, African Americans, you will realize I have The Betrayal of the Negro by Rayford Logan. Mm -hmm. This is chapter five of Racial Logan. The populist revolt threatened briefly to halt the triumphant march of the South back to the way of life it had mapped out for the freedom prior to the federal government's attempt to organize its own program of reconstruction. Distressed white farmers in the South temporarily laid aside their racial animosities and joined black farmers and workers in order to alleviate their common grievance. But the economic program of the populace floundered on the shoal of free silver and the racial solidarity concept was overwhelmed by a new tide of uh, uh, demagoguery. Cleveland's, that means Cleveland the president, Cleveland's second administration was so beset with national and international problems the Panic of 1893, Free Silver, the Populist Revolt, Hawaii, Venezuela, and Cuba, that he had little opportunity to stop the steady deterioration of the Negro status. He probably concluded that the Southern question, question, uh, the, the Southern, the, the Southern uh, question was definitely settled when Booker T. Washington won national acclaim for his Atlanta Compromise speech in September of 1895. In the following year, the United States Supreme Court consolidated the triumph of the former slave states when it sanctioned the doctrine of separate but equal accommodation. Yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah. I mean, um, yeah. If I hadn't read that in a long time, and and, and I still suspect that um, that Logan, for whatever reason, may have been a little kind to Cleveland. I don't know, uh, but. Um, but but I tell you what on the Stein essay, uh, um, uh, uh, I mean I understand your reaction to it because um, I I encountered it shortly after it came out. I was in graduate school and my uh, friend and advisor and one of the two comrades uh, that I was having this discussion with that led to that book. Um, uh, um, I can't remember whether he passed it around or or assigned it in a course, but like that article had very significant impact on on this cohort of you know red inclined black people like in the AU political science department and and I mean people that we've taught and people that they've taught right, uh, have, have 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 kept the piece alive well listen I want to get to this question because I want to sp- listen we have a few minutes and we're going to go to the, to the patron but we're going to spend the rest of the time talking about the populist movement and I frame this question. Mm-hmm in a way that I think you would appreciate. Um, I think, and this is, this is sincere, I think one of the biggest tragedies of the way black history is taught in this country, and particularly during Black History Month, is that there is almost no discussion of the nature of black political activity during the populist era. And I want mm, you to know mm-hmm. that this is my favorite period of black political activity. Uh, and I think that yeah. the Colored Farmers Alliance is the greatest black movement of organization in the history of black America. Can you please tell our audience why Jim Crow was basically a ruling class response of, to an interracial challenge to American capitalism and the political duopoly from a grassroots movement of sharecroppers and farmers who are both black and white? Well, I think you just did it. Right? <laughs> I think you just said it, right? I mean, and, and keep in mind, too, Yeah, I mean, there were 60,000 black members of the Knights of Labor, right? Also, and uh, with six thousand, I think, in the state of Mississippi alone. So there, and see, this is one of the strengths of that Stein article too, which is that that uh, that she makes the point that um, with the consolidation after World War II of this thing that we know as Black history or Black political history, um, one thing that happened was that the nature of how like the universe of what counts as black political activity got defined was that only stuff that bears directly on 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 race or on combating racism counts as you know black political act- activity 
and right. also so, only black political activity that is divorced of interracial, cross-racial coalitions. Right. Right. No, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I mean, the reality is that 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 never was what well, that that's that's not how black people, by and large, had gone about doing their politics. Right. Uh, and, and certainly not in in the late 19th century. Um, so, yeah, but I think you gave the explanation, man. And, and I mean, that's 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 also um, part of the work that race does. Right. And and and, uh, and the one point I make in the book is that race ideology and and uh, and uh, you know, racial hierarchy, well, it was definitely most aggressively and 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 immediately and catastrophically imposed on black people was also an ideology that was imposed on white people. And by that, I'm not trying to suggest that, you know, Southern whites would have been drawn to like um, 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 to interracial harmony or whatever. Um, but closing off the possibility of any effective kind of interaction, right, uh, was, was part of you know, a divide and con conquer thing. Because among other things, like it set the parameters of politics among white people, right, on, on, on ter which, which were the only politics at that point, on, on terms that were very sharply skewed to the upper classes' concerns and interests, right? Uh, and I mean, that's, um, and I mean, that's part of the explanation. It's kind of a simple one. Uh, I, yeah, I know somebody in the chat uh, is concerned that I don't seem to have a cultural analysis. But I'm not even sure I know what that means. But, but, um, um, but, what, what, but often people say, well, why is the labor movement weak in the South? And, it, and, and, and you get all this cultural exceptionalist bullshit. Oh yeah, that's right. Somebody else asked what, what, what I thought about, uh, you know, the, um, you know, the work of the young C. C. Van Woodward. I like it a lot. Um, but, uh, but yeah, like the line is, so I'm going to stop looking at the chat for a while. But the line is, is, it is does that, draw you uh, in. Oh uh, uh, yeah. Well, you um, know, we, uh, go ahead, go ahead, continue it off. Well, yeah, uh, that, that, that Southern culture was conservative, backward, but all you need to know really Right, is that disfranchisement altered um, you know, the capacity to shape the political agenda in ways that that effectively cut the working class of whatever color out of politics. Right, so um, white workers had to um, find ways to craft or to define and pursue their own interests within a political universe that's set entirely by. By uh, you know, by the upper class, and 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 I want to say this too, like, and and this kind of it speaks a bit to to I mean the Woodward question too, but like my, my father when I was a kid, and he said this often, uh, um, well, with the orthodox right understanding among liberals, what was that Jim Crow uh, was the product of the empowerment of the white working class in the South after. The populist, and my father would always say, "Yeah, gee, that's funny, isn't it?" Right? I was like, "Wouldn't you think that if they came to power, that they'd want to do something for themselves, right? They wanted to do something besides just piss on black people, right?" So, so it was always a preposterous idea. Well, but I'm see, but see, but by contrast, right, that, that that there was no governor Altgeld, right, like any place in the south, right? Uh, that that there were no few cases where you know mayors or governors would hold back um, use of uh, you know, state power um, to uh, support strike breaking for instance uh, I mean one case was Mayor Fitzpatrick in New Orleans um, through, through his support behind the, uh, 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 the 1892 general strike but but uh, by and large all all elected authority in in the South was unmitigatedly on on the side of the ruling class, and you know that adds up over time. Well, listen, I, 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 I got to get this last question in, and this is going to be a hot one. Okay, Pascal, oh, yeah, all I'll, you can do is ask it. 
because he can't answer it because we're over an hour. Oh, okay. I'm going to ask it. Yeah. So we can take it all well, out. Fast. Make, a, make a snappy, Nappy. Okay. I told Torrey that I was going to post a meme on Facebook today, but he showed oh. me. He said, I showed him the <laughs> meme and he said, oh, no, hold that off. Then I right. said, he said, now nah, hold it off. The meme yeah. said, I love reading Adolf Reed's books because they always include so many references to show how dumb as rocks most of today's black academics are. And I want to have a serious conversation with you to show exactly why black thought today, especially black thought in the post-civil rights era, is as bad as it, bad as it is and why it completely neglects the intricacies of all of this history. And one of the reasons I want to talk about how dumb as that rocks- That was all on the meme? Some of these jokes can be- That's not a meme. You say? It's a manifesto. No, it was going to be a meme. Difference. Tori, sorry, it was going to be a short meme. The part where it right. says that, you know, I love reading. You, you created this? What did you say? You created this. Yeah. Tori, did you see it? I saw it. I didn't don't ask him if he saw it. I'm asking you if you created yeah, it. I cre- I I'm not asking my proof that this shit exists. What are you doing making memes? It's, a, it's one of those Facebook memes where you put a big post in bold and it's big in big letters. You Did you write the essays? <sighs> anyway, thanks. <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you, Reed family, for joining us. Oh, sure. Uh, I've, like I promised on the show Saturday, I guess I got to get a plane ticket to Miami to uh, tisk tisk Pascal to his face. <laughs> so now you guys are going to do a Patreon, right? That's what's yeah, going we're on. Go yes, we're yeah. going to go. We're going to yeah. go and have the, the ask the real questions. Okay. And the real questions people want to know is. How does Adolph Reed feel about Brian Flores and Pascal's mind? There you go. Oh yeah, yep. That's that's the real question yep. because okay. I I, yeah, I'm down. I have my answer on the whole thing, and uh and you know I'm wearing my colors today. Yeah. Because well, I'm him know. I gotta say, man. But but I was thinking about this, Jason. Like your comparative lack of sympathy for the lament of the black coaches is on the one hand. Uh, refreshing and and endearing, right? And and, and uh, chastening, right? So, uh, so I think there's a lot to it. And then on the other hand, I think, yeah, kind of black people who who are your root for the Denver Broncos would be like that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, first ever black. Starting quarterback in the modern NFL. I know. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. You brought they that cut his ass the next year, but that's not the point. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Uh, you brought that's that a good to my reason, attention. But it's and, still Denver. And yes. I tell you what, man. There's a well. There's another brother in in Atlantic City who uh, who uh, you know works for the uh, or he's a leader in in the Casino Workers Union, who, who is from New Jersey, but he's also a Denver fan, and like he sometimes shows up in meetings wearing Mets colors. And whenever yeah. I see him, I say, no, motherfucker, I know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, is, is he in his 40s? Is he in his 40s? Yeah, yeah, he is. If, if you grew up in the 80s, mm-hmm. there was no black quarterbacks. And le- late, late 80s, right. Randall Cunningham came And I watched right. the CFL for a while as a teenager. That's the that only place you saw right. Negroes yeah. was in the CFL. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, with, uh, with uh, John Elway uh, was as close. I wonder what ever happened to so and so, and you go find yeah. him in the CFL. <coughs> and you must have but turned me John on Elway to for years. Too, was like as close as we got. Yeah. Like when we, yeah. when we played uh, football in the street. Well, yeah. We talking now. I could have been talking about the academics who I think are dumb as rock. Right. Yeah, you could have. You could have. <clears throat> a lot of shit you could have done. I mean, no man. Names. I <laughs> no Don't you make a meme about that? Mean man. I wasn't going to mention no names, but. I was explaining to them why explain why they're dumb as rocks. Mm. All right. Uh, well, I hope yeah, you have right, a delightful well. Patreon. And uh, I will check Patreon? in with you all you tomorrow. The no, I got stuff to do, man. But uh, he, he's already in trouble. I am. So, hey, this was fun. I'm glad I got to participate in this. And I will talk to you, uh, all, to all three of you tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Well, peace all right, out. Man. And thank you, guys. Thank you, Professor yeah. Reed. Oh, yeah. For those That's of you that are patrons. Um, so, like, uh, I just sign sign out of here, and then you go to the next the link, other and I'll take you to the champagne room. Yep. Where you have yep. no the champagne. champagne room. Yep. All right. Thank you guys so much. We will see you shortly in the champagne room. We're coming right in. It's late.
Pascal's got so much memeing to do, so we can't <laughs> waste meme. We will see you shortly. Tere, thank you. Tell your lovely spouse, who's probably tapping her foot behind you, that we appreciate you being loaned out to us for the time being. I will. Thank you. And you know she's a big fan of the show. She's watching right now. So I'll see you guys or talk to you guys tomorrow. Peace. All right.